the, the major causes of morbidity um, and mortality among um, American teenagers are self-inflicted behaviors. Um, so motor vehicle crashes, homicide, suicide, drug-related uh, behaviors that lead to, to uh, health consequences either because of the drugs themselves or because when you're using drugs or drinking, you're more likely to have an accident, get into a fight, have unprotected sex, and so on. Um, so our approach to dealing with these problems in this country for years has been through classroom-based education. Um, abstinence education, um, just say no ed education, and so on. And, and if you look at these programs and, and you look at the evaluations of these programs, you can't help but come away disappointed, and perhaps even skeptical. I mean, DARE, which is all over the country, um, doesn't work at all. I mean, we know that from good studies of DARE. Abstinence-only education, which has been thoroughly evaluated, doesn't work. Um, driver's education, I learned recently, doesn't work. I mean, so educating kids about avoiding risky or harmful situations or, or substances um, doesn't seem to make much of a difference. And, and I think that if you look at, at basic social psychology, um, that's not surprising because what most studies show is that it's not hard to change people's attitudes and knowledge, but it's really hard to change their behavior. And so in our work, um, we've asked, well, why is it that kids know that these things are risky, know that these things are harmful, and still do them anyway? I mean, you know, a huge proportion of kids have sex um, without using condoms. I mean, they've been told over and over and over again that that's dangerous. A, 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 a large proportion of kids become cigarette smokers, regular smokers. They've been told over and over again that that's dangerous. I mean, why do they do these things? And uh, my argument is, is not that we should stop telling them uh, the, the facts about risky behavior, um, but that we need to understand that kids engage in a lot of risk-taking behavior for reasons that have nothing to do with their knowledge or beliefs. Uh, they have to do um, with something that I talked about earlier, which has to do with this increase in sensation-seeking and thrill-seeking that occurs during early adolescence that has to do with changes in the brain. And it has to do with the still maturing control system that regulates impulses, that allows us to make better decisions. And, and middle adolescence, let's say from 14 to 17 or so, is a time when you have a very easily aroused reward system, which makes you uh, less attentive to the possible costs of a risky decision and more attentive to the immediate rewards. Uh, so you have this hyper-aroused reward system and you have this immature impulse control system. So kids pursue their rewards and they don't have the brakes to, you know, to, to put on. So how can, how can we address this? Because clearly, you know, when you were on a couch making out with your girlfriend and you're aroused, you know, if you don't have the maturity of judgment to stop and say, you know, we should use a condom before we go any further, um, you're going to have unsafe sex. So the, 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 um, the approach I think we need to take for many of these behaviors is by changing the context in which kids live, not by trying to change the kid. Because I don't think we can change this aspect of adolescence, nor do I think we should. Um, what do I mean by changing the context? Uh, graduated driver's licensing is a perfect example of this. It is well established that adolescents have more crashes when they're driving with other adolescent passengers in the car than when they're driving by themselves. We did a study in our lab in which we manipulated this experimentally and found the same thing. And we're doing brain imaging work now in which we're seeing why this is likely to be the case. Um, up until fairly recently, there were no restrictions on kids having passengers in the car when they first got their licenses. Well, this doesn't make any sense, given what we know from the actuarial data and from scientific research. I mean, having passengers in the car when you're a teenager um, increases your risk of having a crash to about the same degree that drinking does. So it's a really serious risk factor for, for having a crash. Um, and most parents, I think, um, would hesitate to turn the car keys over to their teenager if they smelled alcohol on her breath. Um, but would they even ask if she was going to pick up a bunch of other kids and drive around with them, even though they're both risky. So graduated driver's licensing sets restrictions early on in the licensing process 
over the conditions under which kids can drive. All right, that has been very, very effective in states that have implemented it and, and states where it has enforced it. We could have classroom-based education in which we told kids, you know, if you have your friends in the car, it's going to increase the likelihood of an accident, and I'll bet that they wouldn't change their behavior at all. But, but, in, but having a law that says they can't do it, they can lose their license if they drive that way, that has shown to be effective. And that's what I mean by changing the context rather than trying to change the kid.